Welcome to Arts Alive, the arts programme. And we're here today in the Valley Community Theatre in Netherly. And we're watching the intriguingly entitled Wicked Fish Company. They're rehearsing for their special new production called From There to Here. Come and listen. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls. And welcome to a very special show. My colleagues here are very excited to have you here, as am I. Now, this is a story about idiots, imbeciles, mentally defectives. Oh, don't be, don't look at me like that. I'm just using proper medical terminology from 1910, where our story begins. The Royal Albert Institute in Lancaster. The Royal Albert Institute for the Education, Care and Training for Idiots, Imbeciles and Mentally Defective People. <laughs> Such a lovely place. I'm here talking to Sue O'Brien. Who, Sue, you're the Development Director, I believe. That's right. And this amazing title, Wicked Fish, where did that come from? It's a very long story, but I'll give you the short version. Um, Di previously worked with some of our guys at Liverpool Community College, and they were known as Fish Barrel, um, and they st wanted to set up their own theatre company. Um, so Di decided that we would take them on. We were a different theatre company at the time. So we decided after weeks and months of names, um, one of them suggested, I think it was Jane, wanted to be called I Am A Bucket, and I refused to answer the telephone to I Am A Bucket Theatre Company. So they decided they'd like to keep the fish bit, and then they thought wicked as in cool. So that's how it was wicked fish. Oh, well, that sounds, <laughs> that's cleared that up. <laughs> so this project, it's, I believe it's a two year project. It is, um, it ends the, finishes the end of January, um, and we've covered quite a lot of um, events and training during that time. I, I, how many people are in the company? We have three people in the company. Um, the actors are all have student membership of equity. Um, we were a bigger company previously, but people went to, to various jobs and things. Um, so the guys would like to stay as three for now. Saying that, we have um, employed a non-disabled actor for the first time, um, Trev. And so it's, it's something new for us, and I think it's something new for Trev. Well, it's an interesting way of running a company. I, I believe the actors themselves actually administer the whole thing. They, they do. Um, we actually wanted them to be involved in the whole of the company, not just the acting side. Um, and we've given them computer training um, through a family history just to get them interested. Um, and they do admi admin work as well. And one one thing that I really love is they love filing and I hate it. Um, so we have a picture filing system and I have to remember which file goes with which picture. So when was the company established? It was established in 2003. Um, as I said earlier, I was working with the company at the college and the college funding ran, ran out. So we decided to set up a theatre company um, and that's how it started, basically. Well, you said funding. I know in the arts, funding is always a major concern. What, how do you manage with that sort of thing? Well, for this project, we actually had a grant from Heritage Lottery Fund, um, which was fantastic because we were able to do so much f during this project. Um, you, normally, we get funded by charitable trusts, um, but recently we've had our first Arts Council grant for quite some time um, to do a research and development project. Well, so that must make a huge difference. It, it does, because we don't actually get money for, for the core costs of the company. Um, we are putting in applications to change that. Hopefully it will. So this show that you're rehearsing for now, From There to Here, I believe you're going to be uh, doing it a number of times. We are. Um, we will be doing three public performances and three performances in schools. There'll be a performance here on the 20th of January. Um, we're at Central Library on the 24th, and on the 30th, we're at the Museum of Liverpool. Um, the three schools will be King David Primary School, Gattaca School, and Redbridge School in Fazakerley. 
Well, this is an unusual company that we were talking about, the way it was set up. Are there any other companies like this in the UK? Yes, there are up and down the country. Um, but we know that um, Wicked Fish is one of three theatre companies in the UK that actually give student membership of equity cards to their actors. So it's actually got a very, very positive outcome. Absolutely, yes. How long is the project going on for now? Um, it finishes at the end of January and then we're hoping to reapply for a more detailed and interactive project with the Heritage Lottery Fund, fingers crossed. Could you tell us again when are the three public performances? They're on Tuesday the 20th, which is Valley Community Theatre in Netherley, Saturday the 24th, which is Central Library, and the 30th, Friday the 30th, is at the Museum of Liverpool, um, and the tickets are free. Take your usual seat. I think it's plumbing. Yes, the plumbing's been fixed for quite some time now. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Please take your usual seat. Okay. Now, if you'd all like to open our books to page 95, the morning prayer. Di Christian is the creative director of this production. Di, from there to here, where did, where did this intriguing idea come from? Well, this is actually the last part of quite a long project, two-year project, funded by the Heritage Lottery. Um, and this is, in a sense, it's pulling together all the strands of research that we've managed to, to plough into over the last two years. We had an exhibition as part of the project. The whole project was called People Like Us, which was an idea from Neil. Um, and we had an exhibition halfway through the project uh, and we called that From There to Here. What we did for that exhibition was go away and research where people with learning difficulties went to school, essentially. And we found, that people from Liverpool, we found that a lot of people went to the Royal Albert Institution in Lancaster. They were sent, um, not locked away for life, but sent for education, care and training. Some came home, some moved on to other institutions, some unfortunately, because of all kinds of medical problems, died while they were in, in the institution. And one of the things that intrigued us, as well as the stories of real individual people like Kenneth and Percy and um, Ada, we had lots of individual stories, was the fact that we think we're so much better now. We think our, our social services, our educational services are all so much better and people with learning difficulties are getting the education, the care support that they need. Um, and we started to think, well, actually, what are we that much better? Are we act actually saying that to go to a day centre, which incidentally none of the actors in Wicked Fish actually want to go to and have never been to, but is going to a day centre any better than going to an institution like the Royal Albert? Maybe all, the only thing that's different is the size um, and the fact that you don't travel out of the city. So we started kind of looking at the way that people think about the past and the way that people think about people with learning difficulties is that they were locked away. Nothing good ever happened to them. Um, and we know that a lot of abuse over the years has um, occurred in, in big and small institutions, and still does. Um, we know that, but we didn't want to do a piece about that. We wanted to do a it piece... It would be so easy to fall into that, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah, to do a, a, a compulsive thing and include all that. Yeah, I think very much when we did the um, exhibition, um, I think it was Robert Hewis, and I'm not sure, who said that people come to museums to find what they already know. And we know that a lot of people understand what happened, in, particularly prior to Care in the Community initiatives in the, in the uh, mid-90s, what was actually happening in the big institutions. Most recently, institutions like Winterbourne View, um, people were prosecuted and, and imprisoned. And... We know all of that, but what we don't know is people's stories. We don't know the people's histories. We don't know, for example, information about inmates, about patients, about school children that wasn't written 
by teachers, by parents, by doctors, by nurses. We don't hear people's voices. We don't hear anybody saying, well, actually, I went to school. It was a bit horrible at times, but at times it was all right. You know, we don't hear that that kind of hum human voice. So we decided um, the cruelty that the, I think we we put into the exhibition, and which comes into the, the, the play, if you like, is that um, the people that, that we know with learning difficulties in, in, in the past, the people that we've researched, they were treated as a little bit less than human. And the whole system did that. It wasn't necessarily abusive, could be. It wasn't necessarily brutal, it could be. But it was very, very enclosed. It was very rigid. It was very tight. It was not about independent living. It was not about self-advocacy. It was about getting people to a place where they could be useful to society. The thing that struck me so forcibly when I was watching the rehearsal, we went from laughing hysterically <laughs> to rigid with shock and, and sadness mm. in a few seconds. Oh, I'm glad that happened. <laughs> no, it was quite noticeable. Really? You went from one to the other. Astonishing. Yes. Yeah. I think that's that's what I, as a director, that's what I like to do. Um, I don't believe that theatre should make people feel bad from curtain up to curtain down. Nobody learns that way. There's no point in standing in front of an audience and saying, by the way, this is what we did. This is how horrible it is. Don't you feel guilty? Because what I want is for somebody to do exactly that. Oh, we had one of those. Oh, yeah, Minin. Oh, Minin used to say that's that. That's exactly yeah. how I felt. Yeah, good. It's working. It's working. That's the, that's the style that I want. Because that's what people remember. Because it actually makes them feel, my God, I used to say that. I used to do that. I said, my, my, my friends... Um, you know, if a, if, a, if a young person goes out of here saying, I won't say mong out on the sofa anymore. Then I you've, really don't want you've to. succeeded. Yes, yes. And we've done it by stealth. <laughs> Many thanks, Di, for having us here. It's been fascinating. You're very welcome. So we go from wicked fish to something quite different. After the break, we'll be at the Tate for another one of our 10 minutes at the Tate. See you then. Here we are in front of a, a Picasso painting, again, one of the most famous artists of the 20th century, perhaps the most famous artist of the 20th century. And there is a reason why Picasso is so important and why he's so famous. Uh, people often argue as to where does modern art begin? Does it begin with Impressionism? Does it begin with someone like Matisse, maybe? Uh, but a lot of people say that modern art really begins with Picasso. A lot of people say that the first truly modern painting was Le Demoiselle d'Avignon, painted by Picasso in 1907. Uh, and Picasso wasn't just interested, like some other artists before him, in a freer use of colour and uh, a freer use of paint, which is something that's already happening in art at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. What Picasso does, he begins to question the whole idea of how we represent a three-dimensional space on a flat surface. So again, if I was painting you, I would paint you quite large. Anyone in the distance would be painted quite small. And even though I'm painting on a flat surface, I'm trying to create the illusion of space and distance and perspective. And normally we think of the artist looking at something from one single point of view. Well, Picasso questioned that. Of course, that's the way Picasso has been trained. He's been trained in that classical Western European kind of uh, style. Um, Picasso famously said, he said, at the age of seven, I could paint like Raphael. It took me a lifetime to learn to how to paint like a child, which is a nice quote because a lot of people say about modern art, oh, a child could do that. Well, Picasso would take that as a compliment. But there's something very sophisticated going on as well about depicting the world around us. Um, what you've got here is what looks like an abstract painting. A lot of people say that Picasso is an abstract art or he's the beginning of abstract art. But in fact, 
Um, Picasso denied that he was an abstract artist. He was always looking at the world. He was always working within the genres of still life and portraiture, perhaps landscape. And what you've got here is a title which sounds very traditional. The title is Bowl of Fruit, Violin and Bottle. And a lot of people look at it thinking, where are all these objects? Well, what you've got here is this violin is seen from one angle. So the violin is seen from the side, if you like, from that way. But then the top of the violin is seen from that way. Uh, and then the, the body of the violin is seen from all kinds of different angles. So we've got all these multiple viewpoints uh, of one single object there. The table is seen from different angles. If I was Picasso and I was painting you, I might walk round you and paint you from different angles. I might paint your nose from one angle, then your eye from this angle. So we have a single painting made up of multiple viewpoints. Uh, so this is something Picasso is saying, this is something I can do as a painter that the camera can't do. Again, the camera has changed things. So what can we do with paint that the camera can't do? There's no point in doing something with paint that the camera can do. Uh, a lot of people look at this and think, well, where's the bowl of fruit? Is this the bowl of fruit? Uh, is this the bottle of wine? This looks like a bottle of wine as well. Uh, a lot of people, I wouldn't worry too much. Don't worry too much whether you uh, can see all the objects in the painting because the subject matter of the painting is less important than the composition. You could say that the subject matter is there to serve the composition. And a lot of people say that if the subject matter is only there to serve the composition, then then why worry about subject matter? Why, why not become a completely abstract artist? So you could say that even though Picasso denies that he's an abstract artist, he starts the ball rolling for other artists to become abstract artists later on. Uh, the other thing that he was interested in was also was African art, African masks and African sculpture. Um, and I think he was looking for a language in art outside his, that Western training, that European, that classical training. Um, children's art as well as we were just mentioning there, cave drawings as well kind of influenced. Uh, we were talking before about Jackson Pollock being influenced by maybe a more primitive sort of art as well. Uh, but also the other thing is it's quite sophisticated as well in that it's quite geometrical. Uh, early cubism, I mean this is what we call cubism in art, early cubism tends to be a lot less colourful than this. It tends to be very browns and greys and sometimes even looks black and white. Whereas here it gets a little bit more playful and a little bit more colourful. And there's even an element of collage. This uh, newspaper here, um, it looks like collage but in fact it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a painting, but Picasso was doing lots and lots of collage at this time. And sometimes he would make a painting and look at a collage, so he would paint from his collages. Um, a really revolutionary thing to do, actually, and also the sand, the sand in this painting. So these dark bits are actually bits of sand in the painting, so they really stand out, in, uh, stand out of the composition there, so it's really textured. So the idea of collage and the idea of making a texture or sculptural almost 3D effect on a, on a canvas was something that really appealed to him. But also, I think it was a really revolutionary thing as well. It's true that people were making collages before Picasso. You know, there's Victorian collage, there's scrapbooks, and there's, there's, uh, there's Christmas cards. There's those two girls who did those fairy pictures using photo montage. But I think um, Picasso was the first artist to really say, well, no, it's okay to use collage in an artwork, in a gallery. And ever since then, um, artists have done all kinds of things. Um, the surrealists enjoyed collage. You know, if I had the Mona Lisa and David Beckham next to each other as a couple, I can do that with collage. I can make a kind of surreal grouping. The pop artists love collage. Um, Andy Warhol, for example, is taking images that already exist and turning them into something new. And it's almost like the artist, yes, is an artist, but artist almost like as a DJ, if you like, sampling different bits of material and making something new out of them, just as a DJ would sample little bits of music and make something new out of them. Collage, of course, famously used by Peter Blake in the Sgt. Pepper album cover. So that idea of grouping things together. But the idea of using a design that was designed by somebody else and then using it in your painting was a huge step. A lot of people sometimes say they don't like Picasso. Uh, and when people say that, I often remind them that there's probably something in the world that they do like that wouldn't have happened without Picasso. Um, the fact that when you do art in school, the fact that you stick egg boxes to, to your picture, the fact that you might make a huge frieze with all kinds of texture and uh, collage being used all the time as well. So no longer when we go to art classes, we may sit down behind easels and do painting, but there's lots of other things we can do in art as well. And I think Picasso gives us that freedom. So as well as all this modernism and intellectual language about Picasso, there's also a kind of playfulness about Picasso and a joy of life in Picasso. Not only is he interested in all these kind of 
modernistic geometrical patterns, there's also a kind of folk art to Picasso as well. Remember that Picasso is Spanish, and even though he spends much of his life in France, um, he's often thinking about Spain, politically he thinks about Spain, especially later in the 20th century with the years of the Spanish Civil War and the like. But there's always a kind of folk art to, his, to add it to the modernism. There's this blend, this blur, if you like, between what we might think of as Spanish folk and 20th century modernism. The frame, for example, is a very Spanish, folky sort of frame. And also the tablecloths here are often associated with more like you know, embroidery and home art and folk art rather than modernism. And I think Picasso, again, questions the idea of status in art. You know, what do we think of as a grand painting? Why do we um, pay attention to something as art and other things not? Why do we look at everyday folk art as something trivial and a painting in the Tate Gallery as something else? Whereas Picasso, I don't think, was interested in that. I think Picasso wanted his art to reach people and was interested in the art of normal people later in the 20th century and actually got people to help him. He did some ceramics later and worked at a factory in the south of France getting people to, to produce these ceramics for him. So he really enjoyed working with normal everyday people and I think that's something important to get across. Politically he was a champion of the normal working man as well. So I think um, sometimes people think that art is elitist and in fact I think elitism was the furthest thing away from Picasso's mind. Uh, it's the furthest thing away from the Tate's mind as well because this gallery is free and people can come in and look at this. I'm a working class Liverpool person and I can come in and look at a Picasso. I don't have to go to Barcelona. I don't have to go to New York. I don't have to go to Amsterdam, much as I love going to all those places. But here it is free in my own city.